I went beyond what I needed to do. And that's where the hustle culture is, is that we are pushing for this external metric that makes us lose sight of why we started the business in the first place. What would the world look like if people felt like they mattered? Welcome to the Lead with Love podcast, exploring what it means to lead with love in business and life. I'm your host, Jada Selner, and in this show, I'll share meaningful conversations to help you, the creative, the entrepreneur, the world changer, reach more people, go after your dreams, and serve your community with love. I appreciate you joining me. Now, let's get cozy and start today's episode. Hey, hey, we are back with season five of the Lead with Love podcast. I'm so happy you're here and I am super excited to share another behind the scenes conversation on my book writing process with my dear friend and personal book coach, Azul Terones. And we are going to explore the evolution of how I wrote my newest book, and she's out. She builds the anti-hustle guide to grow your business and nourish your life. And if you've ever wanted to peek behind the curtains of what it's like to publish a book from concept to completion, where you're just discovering your idea to what you want to write, to actually getting your book out into the world, then you will love today's conversation. Now, Asul and I have been having these conversations about the writing process of my book since 2019. And I think it's really cool that we have captured the last three years of my writing journey going from book proposal to published. And today's episode is part four of our behind the scenes of my book series. So if you haven't listened to the other episodes and you want to catch up or listen after this episode, head over to jadaselner.com slash 156. That will take you to part one. Part two will be jadaselner.com slash 179. And part three is at jadaselner.com slash 185. And today's conversation, if you want the notes and the quotes, head over to jadaselner.com slash one nine zero. So where we left off in part three was I was at the beginning stage of getting my first draft chapters sent to my editor at Harper Business. And that season really feels like a sprint when you're just trying to write, get the words onto page, getting them sent. But what I talk about in this episode is how writing a book is not a sprint. It's not even a marathon. It is a triathlon. So I'm super excited to be pretty close to the end of this triathlon because it takes a lot of stamina, a lot of inspiration, a lot of support. But the book is officially available at shebuilds.com. You can pre-order it right now. And I have bonuses that will really help you start your year with clarity and focus. And I have a couple of different tiers depending on how many books you purchase. But even if you just purchase just one book, you will get access to the Write Your Future Vision video training, which is a guided self-paced course that will help you clarify what you want to build in the next three years. I also include a couple's annual retreat guide and schedule. You can do this with your partner, spouse, friend, business bestie. This is the exact schedule that I created for my husband and I to do every year when we go to a cabin to dream and reflect on our year. It's just a very helpful template, which uses a lot of exercises from the book. So it gives you your own personal you know, retreat and getaway. So head over to shebuilds.com. That's S-H-E-B-U-I-L-D-S.com to claim your bonuses right now. And my book will officially be available on November 15th, 2022 at your favorite booksellers, whether it's Barnes and Noble, your favorite indie bookseller or Amazon, you can purchase the book. 
also Target, which, you know, I love me some Target. So a little bit of a reminder, if you haven't met a soul before, he is the host of the top writing podcast, Authors Who Lead, and he helps entrepreneurs and leaders write and publish books that people love. And his coaching program, Authors Who Lead, is built around the idea that creating books is about building the conversation that you want to own. Now, Asul is a fascinating storyteller. He's a phenomenal friend and a coach with a teacher's heart. He has his own TEDx talk, What Makes a Good Teacher Great, which has been viewed over three million times. So Asul knows a thing or two about messaging and really telling meaningful stories from the heart. So I am super excited to dive into another behind the scenes of my book writing process with a soul. I'm excited for us to have this conversation. This is actually part four. And I was looking at the dates of our first conversation of sharing behind the scenes of the book writing process. And something that we've noted in our previous conversations is how long it takes from that concept to completion. But our first episode was in May, 2019. Wow. And then our second conversation, and that was episode 156 on the Lead with Love podcast and also on your podcast. And then November 25th, 2020 was our second conversation. And then our last one before this one was November, 2021. So It's just really cool for us to have documented this to also for us, you know, to document our own friendship and deep conversations about creativity, about, you know, being in the mix of writing a book and what it actually takes and how much hemming and hawing and all of that. So I'm excited for us to dive in and really talk about this on part four. And I'm on the other side, I think, where we were in 2018. 21, I was just doing the hotel solo writing retreats and kind of getting my chapters in. And now where I am today is the book is done. It is recorded. The audiobook is completed. The book has gone through several revisions and editing and all of the things that, I, and I would love to just document that too, because I think so often those were the things I was Googling, like what's next, what's next, what's next. But I also think that there is an intention why editors don't tell you all the steps because it's very long and overwhelming and you probably wouldn't move forward. So they're just like, just deliver your manuscript, your combined manuscript on next date. And I'll tell you the next step after that. So (laughs) no, that's exactly how we do it too. Because if I told authors, this first draft probably won't be the draft, they would probably not finish the first draft. Right. And that's what you have to accept is that if you're writing a book, it should be called rewriting books because that first draft is a messy jumble of stuff in your head that you're trying to clarify for yourself, let alone for a reader. So that's why I tell people you have to get to this messy draft first so that you can exhale and then look at it differently. So let's talk about the process because when we started working together, we were finding the message. We're trying to find your way through all the possibilities. And we just to recap a little bit, started with finding the genius that's within you as a leader, as a creator, as a woman. And looking at the successes you've had, but also then looking at where you're going. And we talked about this legacy of becoming an author. Yeah. You're like, Azul, I have this 10-year vision of being an author. I don't want to just write a book. I want to own the author persona. Tell me about that and how you're feeling about it now that we're a little over three and a half years into this journey together. Yeah. So I am more in love with the writing process today. And, and I think that's also an evolution and growth for myself because part of us always wants to get to the finish line, to the outcome, to the completed thing. Like that's when we'll feel the thing that we want to feel. And I have really deeply immersed myself in the creative process, really learning and understanding what it takes to create a book, to write a book, to edit a book, to record a book, and then moving into, I think the last time that we talked, I was like, it's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's a journey. But what I'm learning now is it's like a triathlon. There are several (laughs) stages and evolutions, but I would love the privilege to keep writing books. I loved getting paid to write a book and having a traditionally published book deal, but I'm also down for the self-publishing process because I'm realizing from my experience, 
I'm still doing all the things that I would do if I was self-publishing my book because I care about the quality and the experience and all of those pieces. So even though they have book cover designers and they have editors and proofreaders, I was still hiring my own support squad of support on the outside of even what the traditionally publisher offers at Harper Business. And I think a lot of authors actually do that and don't talk about it a lot of what right. it really, there are so many people, my acknowledgement page pages is long. <laughs> it's not, it is. it is not a one person sport, but I did really enjoy the solo time that I got to be with the book. I enjoyed the coaching that you and I did and really excavating the stories. And then I enjoyed the collaboration of editing and also the editor at my publishing house, them kind of being like the project manager of keeping it moving forward and holding yeah. me to that. Also having my life coach. There's just so many pieces of support. I don't know. I have a new relationship with how I work now and mm -hmm. how much support that I like to have in my corner and how collaborative it is. It's not a solo sport. It is definitely collaborative. Yeah. I'm more in love with the writing process. Like if this is all I got to do and peek my head out every now and then and lead some retreats, I'd be really happy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I'm glad you're falling in love with the entirety of the process. You know, the whole launching a book, which is part of this now is why we're recording this. We're going to talk a lot about She Builds and what's in the book so you can understand how you go about building a message for others, but also to fall in love with the editing process, the collaboration process, because it is a book is definitely a collaborative process. You're one of the many authors that choose to write their own book. A lot of them have a ghost and that's OK, but I love the process of watching my words grow and change the way I see the world. How has this writing process changed or shift the way you see yourself? Yeah. So I originally thought about hiring a ghostwriter. And I remember my friend, Jen Kem, we were in Houston with Nikki Elledge Brown and in her pool, but it was like a ginormous hot tub because we were in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just feeling so stuck of writing. And she was like, what if you hired a ghostwriter to get it to the finish line? Like lots of people do that. And I was like, that's a great idea. Like just lift it off my shoulder and not have to do that. That would be amazing. And so she made recommendations of editors and I started working with an editor and I sent her some sample chapters of what I had already written. And she was like, you're a writer. You don't need a ghostwriter. You just need someone to kind of help you trim the words, trim, you know, the runway of writing. And so I just received that message and I took it all the way on. And I was like, well, editing is going to be really hard and I'm not going to like that process. But then I fell in love with editing. So I think what I have learned and how I have grown in this process, there's a couple of things. One, what I really live by is giving yourself permission to ask for more time. So I have extended the timeline so much, but I think that really supports the anti-hustle way to right. not burn out in the process of writing, creating so that I actually do enjoy the process and want to do it again. So with Simple Green Smoothies, I was up over 24 hours in one day watching my kid go to school where I had been up for so long and hadn't gone to sleep that I was like, I never want to write a book. I will hire people. I'll do whatever to not do that. And so for me to build a more sustainable, more fun, creative, collaborative, expansive way of doing it that I'm actually like, it's sustainable and I could do this again and still enjoy time with my family and my friends and celebrate the milestones. So that was one piece. I would say that the second piece is really being able to heal myself as you say, like the book is for the other people, but it's also for you, the author, the writer that you will change and transform. And I really deeply feel that I didn't feel or know that obviously when we first started working together, I was like, ah, asshole, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that I've really had to face myself so often and knowing my relationship with completion and grief and letting go of things, not just people, but also creative projects. And I've had author nightmares since I've sent the book off to print. There's a thing that we call actor's nightmare. And, you know, I studied theater in high school and a little bit of early college. 
And it's where you freak out that you're going to freeze and not know your lines on stage. And so I've had these moments, these micro regrets of like, I didn't include this one thing in there, or I'm listening to podcast episodes and, oh, I should have done that. So there's these like should have or could have, or why didn't I, and being hard on myself in that. And I remember one night just waking up and like, I am worthy. I am worthy. I'm worthy. It was like my other part of my soul was just like letting me know, like, it is enough. You did the work, you did it. And so just facing those and kind of watching myself be in relationship with myself and how I'm dealing with criticism, where my biggest fears are coming from is actually from my peers, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And so how I'm feeling is I'm afraid my friends all read books and they also are very critical of what books they like and what books they don't like. And my fear is I don't want to be in the bucket of books that they don't like, or some of my favorite books they don't like. And I'm like, wait, so that's an interesting, right? We all have different Mm -hmm. preferences and opinions. And so something that's really helped me with that is I didn't write this book for my friends. Like really, this isn't for them, but it doesn't mean that those fears don't pop up. I have to remind myself of who the person is that I want to serve in this book. And they are going to be so fed, so filled up, so seen and heard on their own journey of growth and entrepreneurship. And so I have to separate and kind of sift out who I'm afraid of criticism or their feedback. I held my book really tightly, like it was just my editor. And I think it wasn't until May of 2022 where I shared it with Nikki you know, Nikki Elledge Brown. And then we did a little mastermind at the Grand Californian and Disneyland for my birthday. And she was helping me with kind of like tightening and editing. And there's this part of me that was like, oh, I wish I would have shared it with her earlier. But now I'm like, I can't change that much at this point. So that's a lesson I've also learned is just identifying your safe people and yeah. who could you let in. But there was still even fear for someone who was so safe to me. I talk to every single day that I'm like, I don't want her to see it. I don't want her to judge it. I don't want to, you know, all of that. So yeah. that's been like a huge observation for me and a, and a growth edge to let people in. And you kind of just keep opening the door just a little bit more like you can read a few pages. All right. You can read the manuscript. Okay. You know, but yeah. it's fear of feedback for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The fear of criticism is the biggest challenge we have as authors. It's the reason why we, start, restart, stop again, start again, change it because we're fear that it won't be good enough. And Mm -hmm. I don't care how good of a creator you are outside of book writing. When you come to writing a book, it feels like so set in stone that once I release it, I can't change it. Mm -hmm. I can't pull down the post, you know, it's just permanently out there. And that's scary. I know for me thinking about it is, but one of the things I've learned from our work together was watching you evolve as an author, because you have a preconceived notion what it is to be an author before you start. And then you start in it. You're like, well, this isn't what I thought. I didn't think I'd have to write a book again after I wrote the first draft. I didn't think that was the thing. And I was like, yeah, because if I would have told you, you would be like, no, I'm not doing it. Or that the editing is twice as hard as the writing. You're like, there's no way. I'm like, "Mm -hmm, it is. Mm -hmm. And so all those things happen. And then when you involve doing a proposal, which I don't know how many months that was, seven, eight, you mean years? <laughs> yeah. The years after. No, no, I'm just talking about when you and I were working on it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. It was over six months. Then there was the season of grief and loss of family members and having to put it down. But I think that having that space away from it was also very helpful too. But it's it's yeah. just to find the book when you don't know what the book is and you're constantly discovering it and rediscovering it. And you can move the chapters around in a million different ways and variations. I thought about moving the chapters around several times. I decided not to because I was running out of time, but there was a part of me like, but should I? But I didn't have enough time to rejig. So there would just be those little micro things of like, oh, could I have changed that? But you just take those lessons with you into the next project. That's what right. I'm going to do. And I have found with the timeline of things that there's kind of these different phases, right? There's the book proposal phase. 
Then there's the getting the draft of something out so that we can work with it. But that's not final. But that's what we think when we write that, that this is going to be the thing that goes off to print. And it's so far, so far from the truth. It's just not, <laughs> that book is not going to see the light of day, but there's pieces and elements that will stay. And then you move into that developmental editing, kind of restructuring, moving things around, asking questions. It's like an accordion where things are expanding, contracting, like my word count was 88,000 words. I think the last time we talked and then mm -hmm. it went down to like 76,000 and now it's just under 80,000. I think my contract was like 60 to 80,000, but I was like, oh, I hope we cut it down. So there was that process. And then you go into line editing and you're just trying to squeeze in as many changes as you can. And then there's copy editing and proofreading. And then you go into the PDF where you're looking at it in the layout of how it's going to look when it prints and then you're rereading it. And one of the things that was really helpful for me, I read the book out loud three times. So in different yeah. editing passes, and that really helped me feel into what I was trying to say. Would I say this out loud? Or I also learned words that are really hard for me to say, like similarly. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Particularly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I cut out all the similarities, but I didn't cut out <laughs> particularly. And so if you hear my audiobook, you may be like, oh my gosh, Shada is fumbling, struggling. It was just the most fascinating words in the recording process where I was like, wow, there's some words or things like to, and then the word starts with to determine. I don't know why that was hard for me. It's like the t yeah. and the d. And it was a fun process, but also like, wow, there's a lot to learn about how we speak versus how we write and think. Right. And you did a great thing. I always encourage all the authors that I've helped publish your book. Like, I want you to do a read aloud, have somebody sit with you. You read aloud to them. And if you feel uncomfortable, let them read aloud to you so you can hear how it sounds when someone else is articulating it. Because that's the thing. You would put different emphasis because it's you. But when you write it, they're not going to hear your voice. The audiobook, of course, they can. But it helps to have it read aloud. You're like, oh, that seems like a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. And there's some things that slipped past me where, you know, there's still some mouthful sentences that squeeze their way in there when you're working with the copy editor. That's another thing that I really learned about this process was the editor, they're not the final say, mm -hmm. but I didn't really learn that till like the last pass, you know? Yeah. So there were things that they call it stet where it's like, don't change this. I want it just as I wrote it. So don't mess with it. But in the copy editing phase, I was allowing them to kind of insert their preferences or the professional way to do things. And like, well, they know best, they know better than me. They're the professionals, but they're freelancers. They're figuring their thing. You know, they just have preferences and they're following a structured protocol. So that's something that I would definitely push back on more in the mm -hmm. future. But that was me feeling like I don't know enough and they know better than me. So I'll just accept these track changes or... Yeah. And there were times where I would push against, I think in chapter 11, refill your well, I have like the self-care styles and there's one where it's the solo lounger and my editor, she was like, oh, lounger sounds like lazy. And I was like, that's me. And I don't relate to that word in that way. That means that I'm just like relaxing on the couch, my, you know, daytime couch time. So it's interesting how words, we all relate to them in very mm -hmm. different ways. So to be really clear on what you mean and what you meant, and even if someone pushes back on it, that it's okay to be like, yeah, that's what I meant. Like, mm -hmm. and, or, it, or that means something different to me. And sometimes when I would change things to something else, I'm like, I'm reading and I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me, even though it makes sense to you, it yeah. still doesn't make sense to me. So it's this tug of war between that world. Yeah. And it's really important you stand up for yourself if you have a traditional published book, not because there's one person right over another, but it is your book. Once they're done, they're moving on. They're not yeah. nurturing this book for the rest of its life. You are. I was talking to one of my clients, Ali Abdal, who has a traditional publisher, I think Penguin Random House. They don't like some of the words they use. He goes, but he goes, I'm productive because I have fun and they don't want me to do fun. That doesn't seem serious enough. I'm like, push back. That's your point. Don't let them wrestle you out of this. Don't make this a lighter version of 
atomic habits yeah make it your version and you have to stand firm if that's what you believe they'll be logical and explain to you why and you can't let them do that because yeah. that's your book and you have to live with it and you know i can't tell him how to write it or what he should write he's a very smart person just like you are you just have to own it and i own my mistakes and how i speak it's funny when like even from a ted talk i get some criticism on there and it's usually people don't, don't like my word choice or he doesn't know how to use an adverb i'm like or i'm just nervous up here on the stage you try this with people <laughs> get in the arena <laughs> <laughs> but what i've observed is i kind of don't mind that's how i talk i'm an imperfect person i don't yeah. i want it to be grammatically correct to a point and then i want it to be my way and let it be consistently my way yeah yeah it's okay I don't say things the way everyone else does. I don't speak the Queen's English. I'm, you know, <laughs> I don't speak. I definitely don't speak like Malcolm Gladwell. So let me just be a soul. Yes. Don't make me sound foolish. Please help me. But I, right? I also <laughs> want to own my, who I am. Let's talk about the content of She Builds because it was never a question of this truth you were trying to tell. It was clear your audience, who you were trying to help. And you can remind us of who your avatar, your ideal reader is. But let's talk about the different pieces because you it's really a book about leadership, love, and overcoming the fear that you have to live a life like everyone else. So you have to hustle. Talk to me a little bit about your avatar and who this is for. And then we're going to talk about how each of these pieces in your book help to frame this concept of the sort of anti-culture that she builds talks of. Yeah. So I think it's a really cool story around who the reader is. I did this exercise where I wrote out who my ideal reader is, and I included photos of past clients, current clients, and ideal clients. Like they weren't a client of mine yet. So it was actually three people. One was Grace from The Hivery. She wasn't a client of mine at the time. Mm. Then Nikki Silvestri, I, I mentioned her in chapter eight of Build Your Quarterly Plan. And Mary Cherry, who I've been working with for... Oh, probably almost five years now. So all were like past, current, future clients. And once I put their photos and images in, they're all mamas, they're all creatives and artists first, and then have used business as a vehicle of their creative expression as well as contribution in the world. And so really just speaking to those specific women, like that was who I was writing the book for. And it's wild because I just led this VIP mastermind day inside my office a while ago. And three of the four people that came were them. And I showed them like, here's the printout of my ideal reader for this book. And I showed them the cover of the book and several different variations of the FedEx printouts. And it was chills, right? We were just like, oh, wow, we're all here in the same room right now. You just wrote this book and had these images of us. So just the power of getting clear on who you're writing for. And if you yeah. have photos, whether you find imaginary people through Pinterest or you have people that you have served or know someone, I think that process really, really helps. And that allowed me to really sink into, this is a creative entrepreneurial woman who is very ambitious and that we actually have to redefine our ambition when we also want to live full lives too and be present for our kids, be present for our own personal well-being. And so the way that I structured the book is the love method, you know, to be able to build with love, L-O-V-E. So I've separated it into L is for lead which is about leading from the inside out and getting really clear on what you want. What is your definition of success? How do you define enough? And to also have a business detox from the hustle culture that has us on this hamster wheel of busy and go, 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 go. And so really kind of opting out of that toxic productivity that's very outdated and was built by men for men. And we're trying to operate in that way. And the book is called She Builds, but any guy could read this book and get all the tools and resources that are just as helpful. And I actually think it would be great whether you have an entrepreneurial person in your world, but also just to read a book about business that centers women's stories. Because for decades, we as women who identify as women or have been socialized female, we've been reading books centered on men's stories for years. So like 
why don't y'all take a back seat and just like read what it's like to be a woman who is balancing and navigating not just their businesses and their lives, but also caregiving for other people. And that is very innate in us that we're showing up for whether it's our elders or our kids or our own chronic illnesses or whatever it is. There's a lot that we are taking on. So that's lead. And then there's O is optimize. And this is really looking at our identities that shift, you know, if you become a parent or you shift because you have a loss in relationship, just the different with how our responsibilities shift and change and being able to honor our time and our capacity and our energy. And so how do we optimize that in a way that feels aligned with who we are and what we want to create in the world? And then V is visualize. And this is about bringing your dreams, your vision, your ideas into reality, into what I call take visionary action, you know, not just imperfect action, but really looking at the big picture of our whole lives and how do we create and iterate from that place. And then E is expand. And that is about really deepening into more of who we are, building on a solid foundation and doubling down on that. And really, you know, an invitation to deepen our roots and what we're building instead of constantly uprooting ourselves and spreading ourselves too thin. Yeah. I love that you use love, um, <laughs> that you talked about moving away from fear. And there's an acronym that goes with that too, to love. And the idea that there aren't very many entrepreneur books who are really for women, by women, women of color, understanding that there is this sort of way that we've been taught about entrepreneurship and about leading and how it really is driven by, you know, how early you wake up in the morning or driven by the hustleness, right? You're up at four, I'm up at three, you know, like you, just, yeah. <laughs> you can't ever win because someone else is going to show you that they're going to work harder than you. And I'm a big proponent of working hard has its place. Hard work is not the enemy. The part where you feel like there's never enough hard work done, mm -hmm. it, doesn't leave life for yourself, for your family, for your own well-being, to grieve, to mourn, to be joyful, to dance, to do all the things that life has for you. And I think it tends to be the male perspective, and I'll just speak as a male, so that you're deferring happiness now for some someday time. Mm -hmm. But as a single parent for many years, I had time before to do lots of thinking. When I'm packing lunches, running you know, brownies for, you know, the bake sale and I'm going to practice and I'm doing sleepovers with eight girls. And there's a lot going on for a parent. Yeah. That's, that's their responsibility. The idea of hustle would make me freeze in my tracks. And no wonder there's so much protection away from that notion. So I, I love the way you've done this. Help me understand, was this an idea that formulated through the writing of the book or that you already had and it kind of got refined in the writing process? Because a lot of people were curious, like this seems like such a beautiful system. Each chapter is broken up under the L-O-V-E mm -hmm. sort of principle you just shared. How did that evolve? I, I mean, I know there I was behind the scenes for some of it, but also then it kind of evolved even more after you went to, to your book to the editor. Yeah, so it definitely wasn't the initial planted seed. It was really trying to discover and excavate like what is here what is the core message that I am really wanting to double down on and I need to count how many TOC table of contents variations I have because there were so many reordering and like love wasn't the initial framework or guidance of how the TOC was laid out it definitely got to that place by the time I shopped the book in the book proposal but even then, if I look at the chapter titles or the order, those were shifted even from the book proposal. And I was having a conversation with Jen Kem and she kind of gifted me with that word of like, this is like the anti-hustle, you know, handbook for women entrepreneurs. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, like my soul just really aligned with that because my friends and people have shared a lot of different ideas. And that's a thing, right? We kind of bounce ideas and we try them on and like, mm, no, that's not it. But my soul just lit up and I felt expansive of like, yes, that is what I take a stand for. And I'm not knocking hustle culture. I do think that it's not sustainable for even men, 
either. You know, there are seasons of hustle. There are seasons when we're going to need to push for something that we really care about. And that came even with the book writing process. I had to not extend the timeline anymore and ask for more, you know, extensions from my editor. I need to like rally and get the support to move it forward. But I think time and energy and our relationship with ourselves and our families and it would just really, really spoke to me, resonated of like, yes, this is what I take a stand for that she builds differently. She builds with love and it's not to exclude men, but like let's center women and that we do build in a different way or we want to build in a different way and giving you that permission to build a little bit more slowly with a little bit more grace and compassion, I think is a refreshing conversation a reminder. I say it to my clients all the time, but to have it in a book where people could access this and get it for free at a library just means the world to me because that's what moved me when I was broke, $42,000 in credit card debt, trying to rebuild a second, third, fourth business. I leaned on books and mentors from afar, listening to webinars and podcasts and free eBooks and going to the library and using those free resources because, you know, it's not inexpensive to work with me, you know, it's in its investment, but I really put everything that I share, every resource, every worksheet, every question, insight tool that I share with my clients, I put in this book, like I want this to exist, that if Zoe wanted to go down this path, my daughter, who's 15 now, she could pick it up and follow it or any other person, especially women of color. I've been an entrepreneur for over 14 years now. And every book I read was written mostly by white men who are Ivy League, college educated, don't have any kids, don't have a lot of, you know, financial responsibilities, could travel the world freely. And I just had a hard time seeing myself in their stories, but they were so helpful and I followed them. But I still wanted that proof of possibility. And, you know, Toni Morrison says to, if you don't see the book that you want to read, then you need to write it. And that's what I really did with this book is I want this to exist. There's tons of business books out there, but there's not a ton written by a woman of color who doesn't have a college degree that has been married for 17 years, has a kid, has for a baby, all these other external responsibilities, has met with grief and loss. I think that piece is really important that we have more representation of the voices that are telling stories of how we could build. Yeah. You said it so beautifully, John. The thing that really struck me is observing from afar. So maybe you can just clarify. If you look at yourself, the woman who built Simple Green Smoothies with your co-founder, you know, some people would say at a, a lightning pace, you know, from zero to almost half a million Instagram followers from a no business to, you know, seven figure business in a very short period of time. Would Jada now do that differently only because of what you observed? Would you have found a different path? Or was that part of your journey to learn? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that because that was a really successful business. And a lot of people were like, wow, I can't believe Jada would be leaving that. But tell us how that intersection comes to life in this book. Yeah. So it's interesting because the way that we built was really built on the foundation of love and being able to show up and be there for our community. But what was happening for me is my heart was calling me in another direction. And I was falling out of love with that business, not feeling fully creatively expressed. And so sometimes we think that burnout can be just, we're working so many hours, go, 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 extend the goal and the timeline. And we definitely ended up getting on that path when we first started we were just scrappy, just stay at home moms trying to figure this thing out. And it was really fun and creative, but we got caught in the hustle culture in like, okay, my enough number is this. I need to make, you know, $15,000 a month and that's it. And to this day, that's still my enough number. But what happened was getting caught in society and the entrepreneurial world of what a real entrepreneur is, is that we scale, that we grow, that we expand, that we, you know, we got so many messages of, you know, you're sitting on a golden egg, a golden whatever. And so we got, at least I will say I got caught in that of let's push the goalpost. We don't need just six figures. 
we need multiple six figures. Oh, we're at multiple six figures. Let's get to seven figures and do it by any means necessary. So we have these metrics that we're chasing at the cost of what? The cost of our relationships, our health, our well-being, our mental health. And my husband would be like, you know, I'm like, baby, I'm focusing on this. Like, stop. And I was like, I'm launching. Can't you see I'm launching? And he's like, you're always launching. And so it was more of the reflection of the people that I cared most about that I'm saying, this is why I'm building this business. I went beyond what I needed to do. And that's where the hustle culture is, is that we are pushing for this external metric that makes us lose sight of why we started the business in the first place. It's like every vacation we would go on, I would be launching you know, it's like, oh, so cool. I'm launching from Cabo San Lucas or, <laughs> oh, look, I have a view of the Eiffel Tower while my family's out on, you know, the double ducker bus. And I'm like, I got to write this sales page. So I'll be in the Airbnb all day. So it wasn't until I sold my half of some green smoothies that I gave myself that breathing room and that permission to get off that. I think I needed that space to redefine what really matters to me to really connect to my ambition and where I'm willing to put that energy and where I need to take the foot off the pedal. So it was a healing process for me because Simple Green Smoothies was built on love and fun and creativity and connection and collaboration with my founder. But then we got caught in that world of wanting more, more, more. And actually, when we started to chase more, that actually impacted our business. And we started to make less because it was like, you're losing sight of how you built it in the first place. And now you're focused on the metrics instead of the beating hearts behind the business. So that was a shift that I had to get clear on. And I remember in 2016, I had my first vacation to, I talk about this in the book, to Japan. I didn't bring my laptop. I didn't work during that time. I just was fully present with my family, you know, drinking and eating all the good Japanese goodness that there was in Kyoto and Tokyo. So does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's helpful because I want people to understand the book is very actionable and very driven by the success an entrepreneur has, a woman. It's not that this book's about just let it all go and float away with love. It is really because I've worked with you a couple of different times and you've like, let's get to your quarterly plan. Let's get the visionary stuff done. I'm like, oh, this is serious business. This love stuff is not for playing around, but it just isn't hustle. It's just, it's really concrete. So I, there's so many great ways to build differently. And I think that's what your book does really well. And one of the things you did beautifully was you created a system. You created the parts, the, the really clear outcomes that love introduces and how to move away from fear the way that you might be used to do business. When coming up with that, because you helped me a little bit with this, with the book yeah. that you and I have been wrestling with, because I didn't have a system. I didn't have a way to communicate it. I just had all these stories about what kids say in my book, Great Teachers Eat Apples. And <laughs> we talked about this idea, like you need an acronym, you need something to hold it on to. Like, yeah. And then I came up with the idea of be wild. I was like, I want it to be how to do this and how to live this way. And you helped me kind of get clarity about that. On my book, Be Wild is about, you know, you have to wonder invite, listen, and do. That's the four steps you need to do if you're going to be a great teacher is be yeah. wild. Which because like one, I like the idea of it. You're sort of going to a very natural place, being wild with, you know, who you are as a leader, as a, you got into this thing called teaching for kids and you, you have to stay sort of rogue for children's sake, if you're going yeah. to endure and help children. And there's these other pressures from the outside that will tell you to do, do it another way. But the internal message that was there. I didn't have it. And I think you helped me get clarity because you were going through the process too. You're like, you need something. And I was like, oh, you're right. I need something here. So that iterative process that came about for your book feels really clear, really simple. What advice would you have anybody out there who's either in the process, they've written the manuscript, they're thinking about a traditional publisher or not. What advice would you give authors now? So you're on the other side, sort of the launching side, the book's out, it's, it's done. There's no more tweaking it. The manuscript <laughs> is done. I loved reading it the second time and third time. And now this time, the final time has been really beautiful for me. Tell us what you would give away to someone who's maybe a few steps behind you. Yeah. So I think, you know, being really compassionate with yourself in the process is really important and having people to lean on like you and I, that verbal processing out loud, especially if you're a creative and need to talk your ideas out loud. So leaning on, whether it's a close friend or a coach, or for me, you know, it's like 
I had a book coach. I had my life coach. I had my business bestie, like all the things and also leaning on my mentor friends who have published books like Jonathan Fields with Sparked and How to Live a Good Life, Tara Moore with Playing Big, Kate Northrup with Do Less. I would text them. There's something about the author community that I think is so beautiful. So find your writing community to lean on where you could be doing writing sprints, um, following the processes that you have followed with NaNoWriMo of writing, you know, just writing a novel in 30 days, no big deal. (laughs) And then writing a second one and then on to the third one. I think that like having the community to lean on. And if you are stuck, if you are stuck and you're not moving forward, then you do need to look for what support that you need. And it could be different things at different times because sometimes it's an emotional block. Sometimes it's truly a structural, I need an editor who is collaborative and can think big picture developmental, but could also do line editing. I needed a lot of cuts, like please trim my 9,000, 10,000 word chapters. This is too much. I have too much to say. So really, if you get stuck, look for some support outside of yourself to then guide you back to yourself. And I think that process is really important too, because I had to, you know, kiss a few frogs to find the right editor and collaborator too, because someone could be amazing at what they do, but it's not pulling the best out of you or you're feeling stuck or things like that. So I definitely worked with several different editors to find what was the right fit for me. I need like a little bit, I need some compassion, some empathy, some patience, but then I also need that structure and that like fierce mama bear love. I'm pretty much always looking that in all the people that are supporting me. That's why I love, you know, working with you of just having that. We're both ENFPs. I'm like, (laughs) I need someone like me for me, like what I do for my clients. I need that. And I feel like I always find that within you. And my life coach is an ENFP as well. And this is the Myers-Briggs. So I'm just realizing that, that that has been really helpful for me. That's what I would say is if you feel stuck in the writing process at any stage and you will like every stage, you've got to look for help outside of yourself to bring you back to yourself. And it could be a writing community that doesn't have to be super expensive. It could be a writing partner, but you need to let safe people in to support you because it is very vulnerable and edgy and messy. So yeah, that's what I would recommend is get support. Yeah. Get it early, get it often. And it's, you know, the cobbler's shoes or the, the hairdresser's hair is always a wreck sometimes. That's how I feel sometimes. So it's easy to dish it out, but it's harder to take. But what I have learned in working in collaboration with you, it's been a joy just as Jada talked about the three ideal readers she had and how it manifested. Jada has been my ideal client <laughs> in my in my business. And I've put out little pictures of her and where she shops. And I know a lot about anthropology now because I know <laughs> she loves it there. And that helps me because my messaging focuses on soulful leaders. And so I really want to serve them and getting collaboration help. If you're listening, is so important. Waiting to be good enough or get the manage to get perfect and then share is too late because you're missing the opportunity. In fact, I see a lot of manuscripts go out in the world because they were protecting them that aren't serving people because they're serving perfectionism versus serving the reader. And it's not about you. It's about them. The process is for you. Yeah. The outcome is for the reader. This is amazing. I can't believe we got here. (laughs) It's such a journey to be able to see your book in the world. Jada, everyone's going to benefit from reading your book. I agree both men and women, because this isn't focus just on women. These are soulful leaders that will really be impacted if they want to move away from hustle culture. Where they connect with you to learn more about this thriving, growing community of soulful leaders? Yeah. So for the book, you can go to shebuilds.com. And then for anything else that I'm building, creating, I'm an artist first and a business owner second. So I'm constantly reinventing myself or my offerings, but I love leading retreats and doing coaching and masterminds. So you can Find me at jadaselner.com. And if obviously if you're listening, you're a podcast listener. So mm-hmm. checking out Lead with Love podcast where Asul and I have many, many conversations as well. Yeah, you can find it. And I'm at Jada Selner on all the social media platforms too. Yeah. Amazing, Jada. This has been an honor. It's such a celebration for us. 
as this journey has gone together. She builds the new book that's out here by Jada. You should check out because it will help you understand how you can actually grow in your business and not get stuck in the hustle culture. It's the anti-hustle guide to grow your business and nourish your life. Thank you, Jada, for this beautiful gift you've given us all. Thank you. Thank you, Asul. I love you. Love you too. Thank you so much for your heart and attention and listening to Lead with Love. You can always get the links and resources mentioned in each episode over at leadwithlovepodcast.com so that you can build a sustainable business and live a creative life on your terms. If this message, Leading with Love, resonates with you and you want to take a stand for remembering that there are humans with beating hearts behind the numbers, I would love for you to subscribe so you never miss an episode and leave an honest review. It would mean the world to me and it also helps more people spread more love in the world, which we really, really need. I also love hearing from you. So as you're listening, take a screenshot, share your favorite takeaway and tag me on Instagram and Facebook at Jada Selner. I really appreciate you and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.